The tables, I could do this. Just keep moving, keep your hands up, stupid. I feel lucid, a new viewing. I can see the end, I can see my future, I can view it. It's right there for the taking. Everything I've ever wanted, dreams are just waiting. I just gotta fight for it, willing to die for it, willing to like sort of. Hey, greetings from the year 3000, it still sucks. This is Phil J. Price, and you're listening to The Drunken Turkey Show. You're one stop for this sort of thing. Hit that button, like and subscribe. You know what to do, just like every other podcast. You know what to do, just like every other podcast. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, I guess Dan's jumping on here in a second. His, his computer must have closed down. <laughs> nah, man, I pushed the back button. And oh. so, <laughs> so it took me out completely. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drunk Turkey Show. How you doing, Blue? Good, good, good. Just, I just got, I got back into town for my little two-day little trip that I did. Oh, yeah. Where'd you go, my man? I went to, you know, the great Lake Amistad, Del Rio, and hmm. did a little bit of fishing. There was a tournament this weekend, and uh, I didn't get to fish the tournament because it was it's tomorrow. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I went, I went fishing, you know, bank fishing, and. I was telling my uh, my family and my girlfriend I said, "Man, I, I almost I, I don't know if it was like the old man wanted to kidnap me or seduce me, but he almost oh. got me in his boat. He almost got me in his boat." I'm just and curious. I, was he dressed like Indiana Jones? He he was wearing a hat. Was wearing <laughs> a hat. <laughs> so, so I was there fishing on the bank, right? And I was fishing by the dock uh, where you unload your boats because I was I had just. Um, I was trying to walk that cove. Yeah. And the uh, the older guy came by. He's like, "Hey, man, um, um, are you, I'm gonna go fishing in the boat, but I'm by myself. Do you want to go with me? I'm gonna mm-hmm. go for like two or three hours. I'm like, dang, I only got an hour to spare, man. I'm gonna hear. I gotta take the kids swimming. That's almost gonna take them at ten thirty. <laughs> so I came out here to hit some spots before I bring the kids because. It's hard to walk around the, the lake with the kids of fall off the cliff or something. So, uh, but it was it was good. I, it was fresh water fishing, and I caught two nice bass. So. Dang, well that's cool, man. That's that that is kind of kind of creepy though, man. That somebody was trying to get you to go on the lake with them solo. Yeah, you know I mean they're so close to the border too. It's, it seems yeah. risky, my man. It seems it risky. Like, it seemed like. Uh, Hannibal Lecter looking kind of dude. So like, no, I'm okay. Yeah, you're like you. You might you might be safe for me. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> uh, well, that's that's funny, Blue. That's pretty hilarious. Um, today, what we're going to be talking about, which is something completely different than Big Blue's almost abduction, is we're going to go back into the Brian Koberger case. Um, not too long ago. Well, there's a couple of things. Not too long ago. Uh, one of our awesome viewers sent me a file containing tons of photos and all the press releases and, and everything else. And I want to thank that person one more time. Thank you again uh, for doing so. Let me let me do this. And earlier this week, <clears throat> so here are quite a bit of photos that they were sending me. And, and this is just a small part of the entire uh, folder that they sent me. I mean, there, there's also the press releases, the whole nine yards. And I was going through some of the pictures and there was one that either I hadn't seen before or I have seen it and I just didn't catch on to anything in it. Uh, Big Blue, have you ever seen this photo before? I actually have seen this one. You've seen this one? Yeah. Did you notice anything in this one? I mean, I just thought they were carrying the, the boxes, but I didn't pay too much close mind to it. Okay. Let's see. See, I can't tell what this is on this box. Now, ah, I can't see what it says. You see what that says there, Big Blue? 
you're doing two covers yeah so the other day on our on our live chat i had somebody telling me that there was booties recovered from brian koberger's apartment and i was like man i don't remember the seeing booties on any of the things yeah, yeah. I, I never seen booties on on um on any of the warrants and stuff but check it out what, what is that what's on that guy's head it's a beanie right what, what does that beanie say dude so that, oh, i'm pretty sure face. there's an eye <laughs> i know i just messed with it <laughs> um, he's, he's the whole idaho <laughs> So that's Idaho. And over here, this is um, this was WSU. Uh, that's what we got. We got we we know what WSU found in his residence, not what Idaho found in the residence. That's right. You know, so these are the type of booties that they sell. I wonder which ones were taken out of Mr. Koberger's apartment complex. Most most likely it's gonna be those blue ones. I always see the blue ones when I see the crime scene photos. Uh, it says shoe covers and it only said shoe covers, so I'm assuming you're probably right with these. But why would he have a whole box, you know? I don't know. That's the interesting too, because it's a whole box. This place sells things in bulk. Oh okay. You know and and this isn't the only thing that they sell. They sell cleaning supplies too. Check this out. Yeah, you can go to Home Depot and buy the same thing too. Yeah, no, I know, but they sold this one specific. I'll find it there. There's a Clorox something that there's like a pet stainer that. Um, uh, when I want when I read it, it said that it doesn't affect colors or fabric, doesn't fade. Yeah, now, you can get that anywhere, but I wanted to show that specific part about it, but that it Is won't it fade the fabric. Uh, pet, it, was, it was a pet stainer. Oh, okay. It was a bleach with pet stainer. There is one that's called Blood Eraser, and oh, it's no. kind of like the same. I'm just curious. I doubt it. No, it's, a, it's an actual chemical. Um, blood control kit. Let's see. Uh. No, they don't have it unless I spelled it wrong, which is quite possible. That's why I took a second. To, I paused there. I was like, wait, how do you spell that? Uh, yeah, man. So here, here are the here are shoe covers. So I'm assuming these are the ones that they have. You have your standard shoe covers, your skid resistant, water resistant and heavy duty. Wow. I didn't know that they made such a thing that that's yeah. interesting. When you work construction and I work construction, I always got mad because our company always bought the standard ones and mm -hmm. i got a pretty good size shoe and I, when i would get try to get them onto my work boots they would tear man yeah so i had to take my time to put them on and then you know it sucked because you'd like have to go into these customer houses put them on so you want to make a mess but they would be tearing like halfway on like your your, your foot mm -hmm. so you had to like either put doubles on or just uh like take your time, make sure you didn't catch the corners of your boot. So the heavy duty ones, I always tell my boss, why don't you buy heavy duty ones? I worked somewhere else where they had thicker ones that would not rip when I put over my shoes. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that, dude. I, I, I was completely ignorant to the <laughs> the quantity and quality of the booties that are out there. Uh, here it talks about the different colors that they have. They have white, blue, and black. Um. You know, I know the thing might come up saying, well, he was a teacher's assistant, Daniel. He was in criminology. You know, maybe he had them there because of uh, uh, maybe he just took his work home for it with him. Yeah, uh, maybe he stole a box from work, too. <laughs> I think the latter there, because although he was teaching criminal justice, or criminology and he was a criminal justice student i'm not sure what his classes were but i don't recall them being in forensics and it's not like high school where you have certain teachers in the university that teach several different sus subjects even within criminology you're going to have certain uh, teachers that teach 
forensics, a certain that teach certain law and case law and, and, and things like that. There's a whole subdivision of many courses that are taken. And if he wasn't taking any forensic classes or wasn't teaching forensic classes, would this, does this you know, spark your interest a little bit or, you know, what do you think? It would, it would definitely, because it's like, only other reasons I know people have those is because they either work construction or work sales where they have to walk into people's houses. And when you're walking in from a dirty platform onto a new clean house, you don't want to be the guy that left the footprints on the carpet or the, the you know. Um, I remember when the houses were finished, they used to work for a builder. If you, if you were in there without any booties, it was a $50 fine. Mm-hmm. Once the house was considered um, closed on, you know, and they have last minute touch ups. Right. And, and I, I think I see some folks saying that maybe perhaps it was repurposed you know, boxes that this was from the police department. You know, if it was something that was, that belonged to a victim's family member, you know, that they were pulling out of the house, I would agree. But if they're pulling this out of the, you know, pulling something, especially something as small as whatever would fit in that box, uh, it would be in an evidence bag or box that would fit there. Um, Putting it in a recycled box for booties is, is, not standard. I've, I've never heard such a thing. And so just kind of wanted to bring that up. But I'll ask Steve. He's the CSI guy. He's the one that would know. But yeah, I found this was to be interesting. And, and it, like I said, the other thing is <clears throat> the only thing that we know that was taken out of there was from WSU. And these were the these were the items that were stored at WSU PD, which was one nitro type black glove, one Walmart receipt with one Dickies tag, two Marshall receipts, a dust container, eight possible strands of hair, one fire stick TV, which, or one fire TV stick, which always bothered me, Blue, like that whole fire TV stick. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, initially it could also be a search engine. Or, um, you know, people use it to look, search the web through their through their TV without having to, you know, link their phone to their TV. You just put the fire stick on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It could be. I mean, I, I think there's more to that fire stick for it to be out here, to be honest with you. Maybe. I mean, I think it's like the one... Uh, I had in my room, mine broke, but you know, I would watch YouTube, Amazon, it would have all my stuff on there, and then you can search your videos on YouTube on there too. So maybe, maybe. So, a couple of more hair possible hair strands, uh, a computer tower, collection of dark red spots, which we already found out that I don't believe they match to any of the victims, uh, the, the ones that did have blood. The stains, and I think there was one that was on his on his pillow, which I speculate was probably one of his from like either acne or or a bloody nose. I, I probably thinking the bloody nose thing. You know, he came from Pennsylvania, from the Pocono Mountains, where uh, it's probably a little bit more or quite a bit more humid than it is out in Idaho. And you know, during the fall, I, I can expect somebody to wake up with. Couple of bloody noses here and there, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I always think it, if it's not a huge thing, it could be just if he had acne in the back of his head or something, he scratched it and bled a little bit on there or mm. acne. Yeah. See, look now, this has some stuff in there, and it's in a box that says evidence. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you, you don't repurpose one of these. And these type of boxes have to be like washed out and cleaned and sanitized, things like that. So it's interesting. It doesn't show their feet to see if they're wearing booties. Hmm. Yeah, no, I don't. See, like I said, these were just all pictures. Some of them I'd seen before. 
uh, some of my hand. Like that one, like I said, I may have seen it. Yeah, it just may have you know, slipped my mind. But then again, look, look here, here, here's a box right there. So it could have been law enforcement. Look, there's a box there, and there's the shoes. Yeah. So yeah, they it could be law enforcement. To the scene too. I think we solved it, Blue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I figured they have some in their car, but they might take the whole box. Yeah, yeah that's true. So law law enforcement took them with them. All right. That's good to know. It's good to clear that out. Let's see. Let's go through some more of these pictures. Right, here's the blood that's in the back of the, the house. State forensics. And here's a mattress. Yeah, it's pretty blood stained to me. <laughs> yeah, it is. Mm hmm. So somebody would lean right there. Another yeah. outline. It says, are these the FBI or are these local police? These were um, uh, Idaho State Police. So I'm assuming that if Idaho State Police are the ones that had them going into Brian Coburger's apartment, that it was probably Idaho State Police that are in, outside of that, uh, of the King Road residence there. There it is. It could be but could be. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. I'm fairly certain it is. Hey, what's going on, Steve? Welcome to the show. What's <laughs> going on, Steve? I missed the last episode he was he was on. Make sure if you guys aren't following True Crime Web, to go give him a follow. So you have uh the Jack in the Box, you have the pot. Apparently, uh, law enforcement or somebody in law enforcement had stated that the pot being knocked over was done by law enforcement and was unintentional and had nothing to do with the crime itself. Yeah. But you, you see that um, that cup next to it? That yeah. it's, there's some red lipstick at the top of there? Yeah. Uh, whatever is inside there had been there a while. Not just, I'm like, uh, I don't know. How long do you think that's been there? I don't know, because it could be a one of those chocolate milkshakes or coffee drinks. So it could be just like the, the cream that's on top, the whipped cream. Mm. I saw somebody say in the corner about being in the corner, sitting up. And uh, that could be the corner. Uh, Yeah, whoever sent me, <laughs> our viewer who sent me this, um, I don't know if, if she collected those pictures or not, but apparently they're not fans of Nancy Grace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think everybody was mad at Nancy Grace since she did that interview right in the front of the house. Yeah. See, evidence handled with care. I wonder what's in here. I don't know. That's Frank Goldberg's underwear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's some pictures of more of the crime scene. See, he's not wearing booties. Or is he? No, I don't look like he is. Well, this is several days after the fact, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. That looks like a bed frame. Yeah, that's a bed frame. It's one of those things where, like, Using a regular truck to move all this stuff. Most of the time, you think they would want to use a U-Haul or something. Mm -hmm. Something that's secured and stuff doesn't fly out. But they weren't. They weren't going far. The police stations close right. by. Right. So this is back to Coburger's apartment. So there's a bunch of stuff there, just piled up that they're going to be bringing from up there down. Including a suitcase, and you know there wasn't that many items on that on that list. So uh, now that I'm assuming that majority of these probably or could be from police. Oops, wrong way. Let's 
Yeah. <clears throat> well, we want to um, bring on anybody who wants to join the, the, the stream. We're going to do it a little different this time. We didn't bring up the stream yard. We're going to invite you guys through the uh, you can join by. I mean, we didn't bring up the Skype. Skype. Yeah, yeah, we didn't bring up the Skype thing. So let me uh, invite copy. Let's turn that off. There it is. And join if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Um, we're going to be putting it on a, um, a deal here where uh, you won't, your picture won't come out. So you can come in with your camera off. It doesn't matter. But the link is in the description. The link is in the bio. <sighs> you know what, Blue? I thought I had some there. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I mean, the whole box is a lot, man. There's, there's so many, like, a hundred or more in, in each box. Mm -hmm. I yeah. I understand sometimes, like, if it was a teacher and he kept them in this car, so if they did, like, actual crime scene walks, hey, you guys have to wear this to walk through here. Mm -hmm. Angel so, D asks a question. If you have any questions, uh, throw them in the live chat. We'll just do them uh, and a I mean, that's all we're going to do is just kind of look through some of these pictures. I have... Uh, quite a bit more and answer y'all's questions. Ah, oh, man, well, look at this. Check this out real quick. Here's them taking out the. Now I'm sure. Oh, wait, hold on. Never mind. Somebody's coming in. Ah. Oh. You're on the air. You, nobody can hear you. Uh oh. Uh oh. Who's that? Hold on, hold on. You know what? I'll I'll add to the screen. Yeah. Oh, they're frozen. Oh, or am they, I frozen? No, they froze. Yeah. There it is. Oh. Yeah. It's a little Rogi. That's if you guys <laughs> that's my little girl. Hi, Rogi. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. There you go. <laughs> they heard everyone. Hey, she's Hi, gotten Rogi. big. She's about what, 10 months mm -hmm. now. It's going to be 11 months mm -hmm. here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost yeah. time for a birthday party. Almost time. All righty. Well, let's see. You better go to sleep already. It's too late for you to be up. <laughs> yeah, have a good night. All righty, guys. <clears throat> Anybody else want to join? We won't put you up there. I only put her up there because it was my little girl. Uh, so I can give you guys a little, a little bit of my personal life there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. And of course, also, that was my beautiful wife. Who, as you can see, is not Kim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was that a rumor out there? <laughs> that was a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there you go. We're debunking things every day. Every day there's a debunk, if, including ourselves sometimes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we, we've debunked ourselves. You know, point example, the dang, the dang thing there. All right, hold on real quick. Let me, um, liners, the look at that. Look at there. There's the, uh, there's a tower. And, and so he's wearing the Idaho State lab beanie and there's the tower and that tower i'm assuming that tower is the one that's on the wsu log yeah. i could be wrong because this is idaho state forensics hmm let's keep thinking it's crazy how the eyes always hit into the hole it's crazy what the eyes always cover so all you see is the hole Mm -hmm. He's the whole. <laughs> yeah, uh, it took me another minute there to get what you were saying there, Big Blue. <laughs> if I had my my um my soundboard, the womp 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 would have came out right about now. Yeah, um, I <laughs> what? I I make I'm I'm just uh you know some of the theories that are out there are pretty crazy, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did ha did have a. a Booties, you know, like I know that somebody put on there that it was on one of the reports, 
Because it's something that you would need to be able to get out there without, you know, leaving a shoe print or some sort of evidence of what type of shoe size you are. Well, we, we actually went through with with Steve from True Crime Web and with booties on, it doesn't matter. If you step on something, your your shoe print right. goes right through it. That's right, it does. So um to me, the purpose of a booty in this situation is to not take your DNA to the scene, right? There might be things in the bottom of the shoes, whether it's uh, carpet fibers, his hair, skin cells, things of that nature that he may have brought from either his car or his vehicle or his house or his vehicle. I'm sorry. And, and so it, to me, it's more about prevention of dropping your own DNA behind versus um, trying to hide your footprint, so to speak. And I think maybe perhaps that may have had some sort of aspect to it, but I think he specifically chose Van's shoes because it is a popular common shoe amongst college age students. So that way when they did find, or if they did find, you know, that soul pattern, uh, it wouldn't necessarily go back to him given how common yeah. that that is. You know what I'm you saying? Think, you think that's why they had those receipts from, I think it was Marshall's, right? Maybe that's where he bought them. Well, they had a Dickies tag and then they had a receipt and so they wouldn't have collected the receipt unless there was something on the receipt that made them think that it could have been used during the commission of the crime. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I get it. I wonder what's on there. Yeah, so let's see. Let's go through some of these questions. Uh, Heather, guess I've been here a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. We appreciate you being here. Uh, we have somebody that's going to jump on. Let me put it on the uh, calls. You're on the air. Uh, who are we speaking with? Hi, boys. This is Golf Inspector General. How are you? Doing well. How's it going, Golf oh, Inspector good. General? Oh, good. Thank you. It was good to see Steelers fan. Oh, yeah. She's... <laughs> yeah. And, uh -huh. and your beautiful baby, of course. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Uh, I've been following you along for, yeah, since this whole started, basically. And I've seen you go through different processes, just like all of us. Mm -hmm. And how much do you think of what you know now and what you did before has been influenced by rumors, meaning, you know, when when every news media comes out and says our sources say this and that, how much is that influenced your perspective of this case? Mm -hmm. uh, to a certain extent, a, a bit. I mean, when it comes to the sources that the media have now not all of them are perfect or or 100 but for the majority of them they've been you know scoped out i know that they've had a situation where like for instance they had a uh, person that came out claiming that she was in the same jail locked up with brian Koberger, and that he was you know telling guards he was going to stick them and stuff like that yeah. and that ended up being completely false now when i read that article i completely looked right past and i knew that i was completely baloney just because of the fact that typically uh females and males even in a small holding facility aren't on the same area where you can see each other mm -hmm. and so i mean and, and that's typical i don't know about in every place or in every state or every um you know county but i would assume it'd be the same there given the size of the of moscow mm -hmm. and what they were able to do was just verify that this person was incarcerated or, or um, you know, held in jail at the same time as Brian Covert. And that's about as far as they can go until, you know, uh, jailers start coming forward. So for the most part, it just kind of depends on the situation. That yeah. one, I didn't it didn't didn't phase me one bit. Now, you know, some can of the I, can other I throw things, in two of them? Yeah, uh, go ahead. I've seen you discuss it. Um, one is, of course, when uh, Brian Anton. Uh, said that he he had heard that uh, Koberger has said had, had anybody else got gotten arrested, right? That's the first thing, sort of, that we heard, at least around Koberger. That's one of them. And I know a lot of us have repeated it, but we don't know if that's true. It, you know, because obviously his, his defense lawyer up in Pennsylvania claimed that he never said that. So we don't know if those rumors are true, but they've been sort of baked into this whole 
uh, how we view Kohlberger, right? And I passed it. What did, what yeah. did Brian Enton say again? He said the first question that Brian asked when he was arrested, oh. remember, he said, did, did anybody else get arrested? So that yeah. sort of put like, you know, a perspective on on the case, you know, you can't bypass it, but it's there lingering in your brain. Did he really say it? Did he not? So I'm trying to figure out like how much of this that we do know around Koberger is based on these different like things we heard that are not really, um, you know, things that we can go and tell us facts because we don't know. And then of course, there's another one everybody talks about. And that is that Koberger was uh, released from his position because of fights. And that came out through a source that's also totally independent, um, you know. So how much of that has influenced you guys? Because I've seen your evolution um, go from like, well, is he guilty? Is he not guilty to now being like on the, you know, this is him and that's it. I'm right. just trying to like, you know, do you, do you understand my question here? No, I understand your question. Yeah. The, the uh, we'll, I'll start off with, well, Blue, do you want to answer it first? I mean, I answered the, the first one. I was, I was one of the, the, the people that um, that did throw me through a through a questionable curveball in my head. Is when he when they did say what, that he uh, that they thought he said, you know, was anybody else arrested? To mm -hmm. me, that, that threw a, a curveball, saying, well, maybe somebody else is involved. So I was one of those, and I still sometimes am. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. cause if it's if it is true that he said it, they just don't want to provide the statement that he said it, because it could be more damaging than I don't know. To him, you think like they, that would put guilt on him? Is that what you mean? Or it would put more, more like, okay, if there is somebody else, mm -hmm. was he the mastermind behind the plan, mm -hmm. or? Was he one of the participants? You know, it's 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 hard to tell. Yeah, you start going down that aspect because it opens up a bunch of new windows. Well, I mean, I've seen it happen. Like I've seen the evolution people go through because um, if it's something that you know, the fact that we if we would want to say that he got arrested, he got um, uh, he was thrown out of his position at the school if we really want to believe that or not right and it's easier to then think of him as a as a person of of bigger interest in this case right if that indeed but, happened but the thing is and, and i'd like to answer both of those now um mm -hmm. so the first one as far as who that didn't sway me at all uh because i thought that if he when he asked you know if anybody else was arrested or who else was arrested mm -hmm. um that didn't sway me at all because I was assuming that he was referring to his father for the mere, you know, the mere point of him driving back to Pennsylvania from Washington State University. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's a a common question, especially or a, I think it would be a question somebody would ask. You know, did anybody else get arrested or is it just me? Like, did you arrest my parents, father, mm -hmm. mother, anybody in the house? So I didn't think that that swayed me whatsoever. And as far as the WSU firing. If you, you know, when you go and you look at the at the reports and you look at who the sources are, they don't specifically name them, but they say that there are Ph.D. students and also staff and faculty from WSU that spoke to the news outlet. So it's not just something randomly coming out of the air or them putting together. There is actually people behind it. That I haven't seen forth. that. I have to say, just as a rebuttal on that one, because the oh, only thing I've seen about yeah, it's not that the hard. only thing I've seen on that case at all, him being fired and the way he was fired and what had transpired comes from um, actually a girl on Twitter and TikTok. And I'm sure you were aware of that. Yeah, no, um, no, no, I'm not. The reason why I know that is, well, for a couple of reasons, I know that the... The um, that came out. Yeah, the letter that came out, and to be honest with you, I well, that was illegal. Was... That's sort of illegal because if they do have well, that letter, illegal or not, it means yeah. he, you know it doesn't matter if it's illegal <laughs> or not. Was he acting suspicious? Was his behavior disturbing? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I also know what some of the actual allegations are against him. Mm -hmm. Now, until those things come out and 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 we go those things that go to trial, 
But I can say that from the sources that I have, and I have a few. Uh, I don't have any. Yeah. I, I, the only source <laughs> I have is, no, is I what, what's put out in, in no, the media and what's put out Let's see. In, in actual. And I just want to be very, you know, we all have, right. to, all have to be super careful when we bake oh, in course. rumors together with facts. And uh -huh. facts not necessarily always. The, the facts I'm talking about, obviously, are, you know, what's in, in documents, what we get out of court, what we get out of hearing. So, you know, we have to be very selective when we talk about this case. And I like to be, and I like to not look at those things and form my opinion based solely on what's facts. Not always are facts the truth as we know it, right? So we even have to be careful there. Um, so I'm, I just right. want uh, to I'm ask. fairly positive that the uh, termination letter came out in the manner that it did mm -hmm. and that the issues were out there. I mean, it's not only that, there was also students who spoke with Dateline. Mm -hmm. Dateline had those students. They were obviously they didn't want their their information out there because look at what's happened to anybody else who's had their information put out there. Yeah, they've been they've been ridiculed, put through the mud. I mean, even the chief of police has been blamed for the murders. So I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you have a situation like that, I don't blame these students who did come forward to talk about the disturbing behavior that Brian Koberger was establishing mm -hmm. at WSU. And they were the ones that came out as a uh, killings on King Road, I believe is what it's called. Yes, it was. And, and on that special, they talked about how they created a Brian tally and how there was certain things that led up to, you know, uh, Brian Koberger's termination there. I mean, if you look at the, the letters, there's there's specific names that come out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor John Snyder, and he had specific altercations on specific dates. So these aren't just, you know, random yeah, but things saying at we one don't point, know that we don't know that, happened. but we don't know that for a fact is all I'm saying. And we're sort of basing our opinion. I'm not saying that this dude is innocent. I'm not saying that. I just mm -hmm. hate to see when people go into uh, details like this and it's not 100 percent. It's it's not factual in my mind, at least, because well, it, I where mean, it comes from. I didn't I didn't do any of the DNA testing on any of the people who have been found guilty in, in the world. That doesn't mean that I can't think that the no, work no, no. that was done doesn't that, mean it's not right. That is correct, but that comes out of court. That right. documentation this will, this will if it if it gets into like documents, then I'll believe it. But until it is in documents or you know, until we know it in black and white coming out of court and whatever comes That's out of fine. court is you know what I mean? So right. I'm I'm trying just to establish, like, I think all of us has like that predetermination to believe the media or unknown sources that come out to a certain extent, right? Uh, right. We we kind of have a, a a bad picture of the media, so we don't believe them that much. Well, yeah, <laughs> I've seen that that transgression, yeah. but you know, you you didn't know. You guys had no idea. Who knows that? Who knew that when you guys went in on it and that this is what would turn out? But yeah, no, I understand. I right. just like my my genuine question is like we where we form our opinions on what happened and what transpired in this case is sometimes, uh, you know, sort of skewed on on the facts that might not be facts right just rumors you know what i mean so i'm trying to like d differentiate like how much of that do you guys think that you went in unknowingly maybe and skewed your own um way of thinking on this case and i, I don't no. know the one thing no, no none of that has skewed my way of mm -hmm. thinking on anything the reason why i think coberger did it is because he had his phone off during the time of the crime. Um, mm -hmm. The um, vehicle matching the description of his is seen outside of the victim's house multiple times on camera. Uh, it's seen at a, leaving at a high rate of speed at, at a specific time. And during the time that it's not being seen, there are sounds of an assault happening, uh, you know, 50 feet away. And inside of that building is a knife sheath underneath the body of the victim. And inside of the snap of that, of that sheath was Brian Koberger's DNA. Now, I had questioned a few things prior and early on in this, you know, case, and one of them was the DNA and and the amount of DNA that there was. Mm -hmm. um, there was a guy, his name Howard Bloom, came yes. out with an airmail article saying that that the the Idaho State Lab didn't discover the STR profile that it was sent to Othram, and Othram discovered it. Mm -hmm. However, that's not what this, the the um, PCA says, mm -hmm. and if Othram had, in fact, discovered or created the 
uh, str that would be on there now what's not on there is the igg stuff because the igg isn't a you can't use that against somebody in court that's like a lie detector test you can Correct. you can use it to find somebody but just merely pointing at somebody doesn't doesn't constitute a probable cause for an arrest you still got to build a case correct and um so what ended up happening what we found out later was that no the idaho state lab did find the str profile and they sent that str profile to Othram, and Othram was conducting an igg background tree or whatever you know trying mm -hmm. to pull up his family members and at some point the fbi took over and found him quicker um they did a swab on his cheek and he came back five octillion times it was his dna that's what makes me think it was him mm -hmm. you know this other stuff that comes out is just more uh it just makes it make more sense murky well i mean yeah. and it also murkies the water to a certain extent i think uh with rumors and speculation and things like that and and a lot of rumors as i say come from the media sources themselves i'm you know yes i know a lot of youtubers and tiktokers and what yeah. have you contribute to that as well but they're some not looked the on as a source but well, the media is, is this first-hand information that we've had from mm -hmm. you know friends of past friends of his and mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of documents that have been released from all the other entities that show his his behavior issue is documented and that's the hard part for him not to be able to deny that it's because he was presented those letters you know when he got kicked out of the school not just not just well, college, not... but uh you know the hvac school, when he ended up going to hvac oh yeah when he was kicked well th that was when he was in in high school but when he was a security guard while still attending to sales university so this was during the time when his one professor that never really got to meet him in person I thought he was brilliant uh, and recommended him to the uh, PhD program. Um, while he was in that class, he was having some issues outside of class where apparently he was forced to resign as a uh, uh, law enforcement officer or a security officer at the uh, school that he went to school at or high school. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's that's kind of lingering out there um, that. Yeah that we don't even know about as well. I mean, there, these are things that we just know about there. There's probably, and, and I'm aware of mm. a few things that are going to be coming out later on in court that uh, it's not just this amount. I mean, there's so much stuff there that Ann Taylor is asking for a whole year uh, to go through it all. And I, I think that there's a reason behind it. And, uh, and a lot of it has to do with, and uh, um, witnesses that may have had, experiences with Brian Koberger that weren't so pleasant. Mm. Uh, there was a a video on YouTube on the from the Moscow Police Department, Chief Fry, who spoke about the amount of calls and people that started coming in uh, to report what they knew after the arrest of Brian Koberger. So those calls weren't, you know, um, you know, I think it was somebody else. Those were calls of, you know, people that had some issues. And based on the witness list that Ann Taylor says she's got to go through, it sounds like there's quite a few. Well, yeah, I mean, she's talking about 400 witnesses, but you can imagine that being family and family of family and everybody in the community. So I, you know, it's, it's a lot of people. Obviously this is a huge flipping case. You have a whole town almost involved in it, like Moscow. I mean, there was a lot of kids around there and obviously these kids knew each other. So 400 witnesses isn't really, not everybody's going to be called obviously, to to court once we we have hearings and stuff when this this whole thing starts but that's not a lot um for a big case like this you have four victims obviously you know they have families and so yeah i don't yeah, but I, she, she doesn't work for a big law firm I and mean, they have three guys she, working on it yeah i thought they would have gotten through it by now but like she said people keep slamming the door on her nobody wants to talk to her so well yeah I it's mean, gonna make it tough yeah it's so gotta she's got a talk shop. Thank you, guys. I, I, I got to oh. work tonight, so Daniel's going to stay on for a while. But Yeah, no. I'm, hey, hold on, Blue. Don't leave yet because once you jump off, this is going to knock her into the screen. I don't want anybody to. All right, Blue, you can jump off now. All right. Bye, See you later, guys. Blue.
I, I can jump off if I if you have anybody else. I can. Jump yeah, off. we have one other person coming on. Yeah, I all appreciate right. it. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate you. you. Bye bye. My, Micro Kimmy, you're on the air. What's going on? Hey. Okay, I'll keep it short. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on um, a theory that has been rolling around in my head that maybe the hiring employer in Austin that hired Kaylee um, was Brian Koberger pretending to be that employer and hired her to separate her from Maddie or anybody in that house. And that's why LinkedIn is kind of a big deal. And, you know, I, I remember early on when Olivia was showing, um, I forgot who she was showing the, the LinkedIn, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And it disappeared and she was online at that same time. Um, and then it was something about the content was um, objectionable or something, or it was offensive. And I don't, I didn't really understand that part, but I know that LinkedIn is connected. I just don't know what's connected to. And that's the only thing I could think of was that Brian pretended to be the employer in Austin and hired her. Maybe he got mad. Sorry. Maybe he got mad that she came back to spend time with Maddie, showed the new car and he had a plan to do something to her outside of that house. And he, I don't know. I mean, I'll, Any, I'll, I'll say this. If there was anything like that, that connected him through, um, uh, her computer or um, any type of technology like that, he would have been found in about 12 hours. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, they went through all of their stuff. They downloaded everything and they would have known exactly who he was and who she was going to. I mean, her going out to Austin wasn't a, um, a fictional thing. In fact, I think the, uh, the business actually came out and had a statement. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. Yeah. I, I mean, I just, I wonder what was on LinkedIn that caused it to get removed or, you know what I mean? Yeah, I did ask. That it yeah. bothers me. Yeah. I asked Christy about that not too long ago. I asked her about it and she said it was a mystery to them to this day too. They don't, they don't know. Could it have been, I don't know, a uh, prosecution or, or law enforcement at that time? Maybe they weren't talking to them. So. And they told them um, that, at that it would be legal to delete her LinkedIn. Remember, that's what Olivia said. I don't they know. Heard that, so I don't know. I, I asked some people around because um, I asked. I talked to Christy about that, and um, and I and I told her that I would ask around, but I haven't found any information on anybody ever deleting that. And I'm not trying to spark any conspiracy oh, okay. with it, but I don't know anybody that has ever dealt with it either. So it's not like, um, it's not like, it's like, it's like me asking, Hey, uh, you know, have you guys ever investigated, you know, how many plane accidents did oh, you right. investigate when, uh, you know, somebody passed away and they're like, I've never investigated right. one. It's an obscure so, statistic. Um, yeah, exactly. Also, so uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know anybody who's dealt with LinkedIn as far as law enforcement side goes. Yeah. Um, that's a weird one. And yeah. also, it I think it was also important when Olivia showed that Kaylee was, it was confirmed she was online at the time, right? They showed her green dot and um, something. I mean, that, that could have been easily as, as simple as maybe if she logged in, you know, at the uh, on a computer at, uh, at the college or something and somebody turned on that computer and, oh, and yeah. she was still logged in. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why somebody would have been sure. shown up. Uh, could it have been something to do with the case? Possibly. Um, is it possible that, you know, whoever committed this crime found out who or found um, Kaylee through LinkedIn and they wanted to delete it? Sure. But I would have assumed that it would have been done a lot sooner than what was it like a whole month later? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, I also I also wonder. um and it's a second theory aside from the LinkedIn thing is that the protected witness, I mean, it's all conjecture until the trial, but, um, protected witness. uh, well, like if there, if there is a protected witness, no. yeah, I haven't heard about specific protected witnesses, right. There hasn't been something specific about it, but people talking about a protected witness. And if there were one, it would 
more than likely, like I'm thinking his sister snitch. I really do. I feel like one of his sisters got a hold of law enforcement. I mean, that's the report, right? Uh, there was a news station that came out and said that um, they, that a sister or somebody had said something to the effect that they had questioned him. They searched his, you know, his vehicle. Um, I have been saying it for a while, you know, that I've, I've gotten some word that it's possible that that may have happened. And also in their own statement from the Koberger family, it says that they fully cooperated with law enforcement and, you know, the backing up of Brian Koberger wasn't his innocence. It was his presumption of innocence, which is something that's given to everybody, including those that are, um, you know, that have committed a crime, just not been yet convicted. So right. it's so technical the way they said it, if that's their statement, you know, instead of like, that's my brother, that's my son, he would never, I know him. And then where's all his homies coming out and like having his back, like, honestly, like nobody. And so his family to say something. So it, it's just too, their, their verbiage, but it might be law enforcement's verbiage or attorney's verbiage. I don't know. Mm, I don't know. I don't think so. I think I think I think some of it, majority of it, if not even more of it, it did come out and was true. Okay. You know, we I found a or I was sent a um, supposedly there was a meeting uh, at the Suraya uh, restaurant. Not a meeting, but a dinner. Let me put it that way. That yeah, that's that the thing. Brian's, was tell the yeah, story. <laughs> yeah, Brian's. Brian's mom set up and it wanted a low dim area and it was for five people. And I assumed that it was going to be, you know, Brian Koberger, his mom, his dad and his two sisters. But the more I thought about it, you know, uh, five people. Right. You have uh, some, you know, where's the location of that restaurant? It was in Philadelphia, which is the halfway point between Albrightsville and New Jersey, where the oldest sister lived. So I thought to myself, maybe that's when. You know, they all met up or they met there at that place. Now, I don't know, but I'm wondering if any of Koberger's sisters are married and or engaged or any of those things. And if so, if they would have brought their significant other and if one of them may have, maybe Brian Koberger wasn't at that meeting and it was just a meeting of the family to talk about Brian Koberger. Like they were all thinking the same thing and they wanted to like match notes. Like uh, maybe not. Maybe not so much that, but maybe somebody was trying to talk to everybody while, you know, Cobra yeah. wasn't around. Yeah, and he was probably back at the the Poconos house. Right, and, and this is all one hundred percent my my right. speculation. I'm just trying to connect some dots here. I mean, it very well could have been Koberger and his family. They went out to Philadelphia to go check out the sights, the scenes, take some pictures next to the Rocky statue, eat some Lebanese food, which I'm not entirely sure is um, vegan or not. And I mean, it can be. Um, it's like uh, Kebe and Dolma. Things like that. I'm, it's pretty. I'm not sure. I've never had it before. Olive leaves, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think. I mean, I, I don't know if I've heard anything about his relationship with the rest of his family. He said, like, it said that he's close to his dad, and he right. had said in that thing that he was mean to his dad. But it's clear his dad cares about him. He he flew down there to ride back with him. Like, there was something really important maybe they needed to talk about i'm guessing i mean uh, i think it was pre-planned i don't see anything too nefarious in it to be honest with you um i think his dad planned to drive down there or fly down there and drive back okay. uh, oh for you know, that's what it sounds day. like yeah i don't think it was had anything to do with the case um, that's crazy to me i mean i'll fly with my i'll fly to see my kid and then i'll put them back on a plane with me i'm not <laughs> That's crazy to me how they drove that much, but you know, yeah. to each his own. Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you on to the next. Um, I just wanted to see what you thought about the LinkedIn thing, and I saw in the chat that somebody said it was twelve hours, and then the LinkedIn was deleted. Maybe I don't. I don't even know when it was. I, I, all I did was ask Christy about the LinkedIn, and I was like, "Hey, any any truth to the LinkedIn stuff?" She said that was a mystery to us. Uh, to us all, we don't know who did it, and. Um, Man. that was about it. They still don't know. 
So. My heart hurts for them so much. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the, the fact that this is just, you know, dragging on and going longer doesn't help. No, no. And doing the thing that, you know, we're all, almost a year in, right. Or more than a year in and mm. she's still trying to cook up an alibi. Like that's supposed to happen early on. Right. So God, she's really dragging it out and she needs the evidence first. So that's, that's that, that's there. Okay. Yeah, I'll get into that. I'll get into yeah. that here in a sec. Well, okay. thank you for coming in. We yeah, appreciate thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. You have Bye. a good one. Bye. Thank you, Afton, for it for gifting a drunk turkey membership. <clears throat> Besides the DNA, what do you believe is the strongest piece of evidence against BK? Also, how true do you believe the rumor of the Amazon purchase of the K bar knife? I strongly believe that the Amazon purchase of the K bar knife did occur. It did occur. Um, I think that I have some ideas on it and I may, uh, you know, put something out there to kind of point why I think that, that it did occur or how it may have occurred. Um, but yeah, no, I do think that they do have that. And besides the DNA, you know, it's phone activity, you know, right now, and I get it. There's some you know, there's the 27 mile inaccuracy, uh, the triangulation and yada, yada, yada. But that's not important. That's not what's going to come out of trial. That's only used to get the warrants for his GPS locations, which are spot on. Right. That's the one that are important. And so we're going to know exactly out of the 12 times where exactly Koberger was at and where he was sitting or driving or parked or wherever um, to determine where he was at on those 12 occasions. And also on the night before and after he turned off his phone and turned it back on. So obviously we don't know where his phone was. I mean, we can assume where it was, but it wasn't connected to the to the towers during uh, the time of the murders. And we don't know why it wasn't connected to the tower, but his phone does. And fortunately for everybody, police and law enforcement have collected his phone and downloaded it forensically. So they're going to know exactly why his phone wasn't connected to a network. You know, when you get the triangulation stuff, it just tells you it wasn't connected. You can't determine why. But a download of his phone will tell you why, whether it was manually turned off, whether it was uh, put in airplane mode or any of those things, those things are documented on your phone. So that is pretty suspicious to me when it comes to the fact that we're going to find out that either it was an airplane mode or he purposefully turned it off for that time, that specific time that the murders were happening, and also the 12 times that he was stalking. Now, I talked to a guy who was or it who has security clearance, who was high intel in the military, whose job was geolocation, but obviously it was for you know for war and stuff like that. And I was asking him about the the accuracy and stuff when it comes to, you know, phone triangulation. And what he had told me was, you know, as long as you got three towers, you can be pretty accurate. And also, as long as the person isn't moving, right? So if you have somebody stationary there for a little bit of time, a few minutes or so, you can get really, really close within 10 meters of where they were at. And so if Brian Koberger, I believe, stated that he was, believed to have been stalking for a while at odd hours at a time for about a few minutes or whatever. Uh, if he was actually out there, out there for a few minutes at a time. So th those triangulation points are going to probably be a lot more accurate, but again, they're not going to be used in court. It's going to be the GPS stuff. So to me, I think that the phone stuff is just, I mean, what are the chances, right? I mean, let's, let's break it down. What are the chances that on the night that Brian Koberger goes out driving around by himself, that's what he reported, with his phone off, uh, that same night there's somebody else who killed these four people. Um, you know, What are the chances that he's driving around the same time that there's a, a murderer driving around? And what happens to those chances when we do they increase, do they decrease when we find out that that person also is driving the same make and model car that he is? Now, do those chances increase or decrease when we find out that that vehicle also doesn't have a front license plate? Now, do those chances increase or decrease when we find out 
uh, the operator of the vehicle who just so happens to also be the same as Brian Koberger's to also happen to also not have a front license plate match the height weight that Brian Koberger is, right? And then finally, uh, what are the chances that all that and Brian Koberger's DNA is in that other car that has nothing to do with him while he's out by himself with his phone off? When you put it all together, it's just hard to see any other lines to connect. You know what I mean? Let's see. Um, is that his parents' home or his apartment? That was his apartment. Uh, when are you going on Dinky panel? I'm going to be on Dinky's panel on Tuesday night. So go check that out. Should be fun. Do you feel like they took the house down too soon? Maybe because of the pressure from the University of Idaho. I do feel like the house was taken down too soon. I didn't like that. Uh, I don't know if it's pressure from the University of Idaho. It, it sounds like it could be. They're the ones that purchased the property. Or Let me rephrase that. They're the ones that were donated the property and they're the ones that are having to pay for taxes and things like that. So they probably want to turn this into a memorial and get it out of being a residential thing. So that way they get other tax benefits. I'm sure of it. And they're not, um, you know, paying for that. Plus it's probably deterring students. I don't know. It sounds like they got more kids going to their school now than before. So I don't know. Is there a pick of the receipt? Well, we could look up the SKU number. Uh, I don't think there was a pick of the receipt. And I think somebody had asked, where did the, um, you know, these Dickies cover all rumors start? It, it started because there was a Dickies tag that was found in his uh, apartment and that they collected it. Uh, it could have been Dickies, whatever. It could have been a multitude of things. Uh, but for them to collect it, I think they would have thought that it had something to do with the crime which means that we probably couldn't find the garment itself. It was probably missing. And if it was a coverall, it probably leads to why the knife sheath wasn't on a belt because coveralls typically don't have belt loops, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's speculation, but um, it's possible, I guess. Have you seen the pictures of the beer pong set up at one of the TV screens with no signal? Uh, from the crime scene. Yeah, I, I've seen both of those pictures. Do I have a list of what they took from the Pullman? Oh, man, I just had it up. It wasn't very, very much. Uh, it was a few hairs, uh, one black nitro glove, uh, the towers, uh, the inside of a, a vacuum, I believe. It wasn't very many things. From what I heard, that apartment complex or his apartment was really, really clean. How about the media reporting they lost track of BK when walking back a couple weeks later? It makes me think of Fourth Amendment issue could be walking back and injecting, injecting of routine stops. No, so what that was was uh, the media assuming that the Indiana state um, or the Indiana stops were from or for law enforcement um, because at the time of those stops, they didn't know who Brian Koberger was. His IgG didn't come back till December 19th. Those stops were on December 16th. You know, if you know who he is, you don't need an IgG. There's no point if you have his name. Just go pick up the DNA, whether it's from him or his parents, and then arrest him. You can go do that from his trash. You don't need the IgG. The IgG is pointless at that point. You know, once you have a match between Koberger and that guy or Koberger and, and, and the DNA, the IgG is pointless. It's, it was just there to point at the direction of the guy. Uh, probable cause may contain hearsay. Probable cause may contain hearsay. I don't think it can. No, because you have to. It's typically just the evidence that is presented to arrest somebody and it's not all the evidence so why would you put hearsay in yeah no there are no hearsay and probable cause affidavit we got a new member welcome uh, creo vids music thank you yeah but not not proven to be his car nor that phone data is reliable and why they want to 
use supposedly DNA sheets in court only to swab after his arrest. Evidence is not admissible. No, my man, uh, you got those things kind of. All right, so the car, obviously, there isn't the license plate or any of those things. So I, I guess you can say, yeah, it's not proven. It's his car today. But you have a lot of other stuff that's going on that makes you believe that it could be his car. And, and circumstantial evidence is still evidence that is admissible, regardless of anything. I mean, people have been found guilty on circumstantial evidence. Uh, you know, you don't want them to use the DNA. You don't want them to use the car or the swab. I mean, how do you want law enforcement officers to arrest people? Like, I don't get it. Some of these things that just don't make any sense. Where are the videos, pings, witnesses saying Koberger was anywhere else other than the crime scene? Alibis are important. I agree. I agree 100%. And that's one of the reasons why he doesn't want to say uh, or why they don't want to give their alibi is because, um, oh, let me rephrase that. Alibis are important. They don't want to hand over their their alibi. And so what does that tell you? If they, Especially if they want to wait to see what all the prosecution has so they can come up with their alleged alibi, which, as the prosecution stated, that was supposed to have been done way a long time ago. So before any of the prosecution was supposed to send over the discovery, I mind. And the reason behind that is so that somebody doesn't get all the information there and then come up with a fake, you know, alibi similar to or story similar to uh, uh, the Murdoch case. The guy told uh, before he found out that there was a Snapchat video of him out there at the dog kennel. He was saying that he was out at the and he never went down there. You know, once he got the evidence, oh, snap, they know I'm down there. And he goes up there to testify. Now his stories change completely and it matches what evidence they have, you know, on him. So well, it's, it's kind of obvious, man. Uh, why did they prohibit release of body and car cam footage of hit and run incident outside of his apartment where he is captured with his girlfriend? Well, if they have limited the footage outside of his apartment how do you know he was captured with his girlfriend and if he has a girlfriend why hasn't she come forward why isn't it that um nobody's come forward when it comes to his defense but apparently he has a magical girlfriend uh, to the victims and accused in that hidden run please send me the hidden run information that you have my man drunk turkey show at gmail.com i'd appreciate it that way, uh, I, I, cause, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of assumptions in this, a ton of assumptions that I don't even think any of them are true. All right, let's get, all right, I got a lot of comments to cover. I'll probably do this just for a few more minutes. So make sure you guys put some stars if you want me to see your comment. All right, well, hold on. DOJ standards mandates that VI agencies wear active body cams, especially in search warrants. Right. If they have access to them, my man, you see, here's the thing that that policy went into place about six months earlier. You know, I, I worked in a department at one point that got body. Well, it was after uh, that got body cam cameras and they implemented a mandatory thing. And I think it took uh, about two years before everybody had one. Right. So you're looking at Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, and you're looking at these guys going very quickly. They want to get a quadruple homicide murderer off of the streets as fast as possible. So you're probably going to get the nearby guys. Right. So you also have, you know, Pennsylvania there. They don't have body cams at the time. It wasn't something that they were even issued. And so maybe perhaps there's some sort of reason behind why they don't have body cams out there. I don't know, but it's not something that is shady because it's not like they had body cams for anybody else. I mean, if we can go back and look at all the arrests, you know, around that time and I, I haven't seen any body cam, you know, if you can find it from FBI, from Albertsville, Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, then, and, and then not be the Brian Coburger case. Cause obviously I'm going to show you that. 
uh, send it to me. Let me know. That way we can say, hey, they're treating him differently than they treated anybody else. But again, when it comes to him getting arrested out there in, in Pennsylvania, it's not like they found the knife or, or any of those things that led to his arrest. So how, how would how would a body cam affect you know the vehicle being seen on camera that matches the description of his? That just so happens to be out and about while his phone is off. That just so happens to be around the time he's driving around by himself. And just so happens to have a sheath in his car with his DNA in it. All right, Sam, let's see. Daniel, do you think that the ride from Washington to PA with Cobra's dad was Brian's attempt to confide in him that he did the murder? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, it's possible, but I don't think so. You know, it seemed like his dad went to bat for him when um, supposedly, according to the um, the report there that his family were questioning, you know, Brian Koberger. It sounded like uh, in that report that his dad went to bat for him. So I doubt it. <laughs> Send me an email. All right, cool, cool, cool. Let me let me open that up real fast. Give me a sec. I gotta open up. I got so many, so many things on my computer. Um, but some of them, sometimes they don't all. Like for instance, my this one browser I have doesn't have my work this email on it, and this other one does. All right, I'm here. Do you like? Um, Ah, yeah, that would be concerning. That would be concerning. So Steve says, if the Uline booty box is the same at both scenes, uh, there could be some cross-contamination stuff if the box was taken in both places. But um, that's if there were both on both scenes and if both entered the scene. We just know that the box was being brought down from the steps. It may have been placed outside of the door and never went inside of the house. Or the apartment, but I do understand your concern on that 100%. Let's see. Um, did Adam get Kaylee's job in Austin? Um, I don't think so. From what I understand, when I talked to, to Christy, she had gotten this job as um, an intern and in, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how she got the job, but it didn't sound like somebody gave it to her. It sounded like she worked hard for it from what Christy was telling me that she got it on her own. <laughs> Amazon and NBC have a business relationship. So when NBC Dateline reported the K-Bar, K-Bar purchase, they likely confirmed it through their backdoor relationship. And yeah, it's quite possible that they did that. I also have it from other means that uh, there was a K bar knife purchase, N not just through that dateline, through some of the sources that I have. Data recorded in his car would tell if it was in motion or the car is parked at the time of the merge. I don't know if that's true because I looked up the black box for the cars and they only start to record uh, just a few minutes prior to a uh, collision. So it's kind of like, um, you know, how I was telling you guys that in, uh, from what I understand with police, like footage and stuff like that in, in dash cams, uh, at least you know, 12, 14, 15 years ago when I was in law enforcement, uh, it was constantly recording, uh, but it wasn't saving. And once you hit your lights, it started to save, but it only saved two minutes prior to you hitting the lights. It's kind of the same thing with these crash uh, recorders. They only, once a collision is recorded, it starts to hit the save button, but it only records the few moments prior to the collision. So it's not going to show us or show anybody anything uh, weeks earlier. Uh then the BF move overseas. No, I don't know any boyfriend that moved overseas. 
We have 408 folks in here. And let's get those likes up. Please hit that like button. What address was the Amazon package delivered to? I, I don't know that one. I just know that it's possible or more than likely that it did occur. Um, I trust my source. So uh, I'm going to say that, yeah, it, it, it did happen. But have I seen the actual purchase receipt? No. Let's see. I'll try to go through these. Make sure to put stars. Uh, does anyone know what happened to their dog? The dog was given to Murphy. It went to animal shelter at first. And then I, I mean, Murphy, Murphy is a dog. I'm sorry. Uh, Jack Decor um, ended up, the, the dog ended up going to Jack Decor. He was the uh, owner of the dog alongside with Kaylee. So I believe he still has him. But I, I, I haven't asked. I'll, I can check. BK had a dream of, a dream apartment the next day. Do you think he pre-planned this either to pro provide himself some help while avoiding the ER? Huh. Bring this over here. Oh. Or if he escaped unscathed to prove he didn't have injuries. Oh, he had a doctor's appointment the next day. I don't know if it was the next day. I know it was sometime that week. He had a doctor's appointment. And do I think he pre-planned it? I, I do. If if Brian Koberger committed this crime, right? And this is a big if. We don't we don't we don't know. Well, I mean, we can assume. I I feel that it's more than likely it's him, but he hasn't been convicted, so we don't know one hundred percent, right? Um, is it possible that his intention and his plan was to go in there and to commit this crime in the middle of the night after a night of where his victims were drinking? thus likely living them in a pretty unfair vantage point, thus the possibility of him getting injured or getting scratched up being unlikely, maybe. And him knowing that, would would it be smarter or be a, a smart thing for him to make a doctor's appointment just in case he does come out of it unscathed, that he can go to it? Now, let's just say that he doesn't, come out of it unscathed and he has scratches and things like that well if you go and you know we go look at the report that was out there referencing that doctor's appointment uh, they said that they remembered him because he was you know cheerful or whatever um, they were smitten by him but also because everybody else was canceling their appointments because of what had occurred so had he been scratched up it wouldn't have been uncommon for him to cancel the appointment like everyone else had so it was a uh, situation where uh, it really could help him, you know, if he came out of it unscathed and it wouldn't hurt him if he didn't. So uh, to go through that kind of detail, I mean, you got to check every avenue when it comes to this guy. Brett Payne said there was a tag. Tag for what? Oh, doctor's appointment there. <laughs> I was all dream appointment. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, let's see. I think police collected everything that was nailed that wasn't nailed down. I hope so. I hope so. But there was a lot of evidence in a bunch of places. But from what I understand, though, in Brian Koberger's apartment, I have heard that it was very clean, like sp like sparkling clean is is an understatement, like. Hey, I don't know. I, I I just heard it was extremely clean. I don't even know if they could find um his DNA in his own apartment. That's how clean it was. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Micro Kimmy comes in saying, "Why did they rule out Murphy so fast? He seems too good of a boy, in my opinion." <laughs> mm -hmm. The defense is having a hard time getting the witnesses to come over. Uh, come forward. Maybe. And, you know, and I know that some people say that the, hold on, the defense is having our, all right, I remember where I was at. So I know some people are saying, why doesn't, you know, the prosecution hand over all the evidence that the defense is asking for? Well, in this last hearing, the prosecution said, hey, it's not just about us you know, handing over discovery, you know, there would be just amount as amount of 
what do you call it, um, demands for evidence in the other direction for his alibi as he's been unable to give one. And they want to have all the evidence in front of them so that they can come up with an alibi, in my opinion. I don't know. I don't know. Thanks for answering my call. 100%. Thank you for calling in. They are using the DNA on the sheet. They matched it to BK's actual buccal swab. Yeah. So you think exhibit A is the actual probable cause affidavit? If so, why is the case document? Can we not see the PCA? It came up error code. Well, there's a lot of things that are on the PCA that aren't, uh, that are not just the statement or the affidavit of the officer describing the probable cause. Uh, you have names of the suspect, victims, addresses, things of that nature. And I do think that Exhibit A is the probable cause of the probable cause affidavit. Uh, when you go through it, at the bottom it says, based on the information above, uh, we want, we're trying to get a warrant of arrest for Brian Koberger. Well, what do you need for a warrant of arrest is probable cause. So the information above is probable cause. And if you go through it, it's exactly what it is. It tells you who, what, when, where, how, why, and how they found him the whole nine yards. Right. And so you have an affidavit from Payne, an affidavit that is the probable cause. So in my opinion, I think it's the probable cause affidavit. And Taylor is stalling. BK's alibi doesn't work for his defense. They have to find another defense. Yeah, that's quite possible. I mean, imagine if he did say something to his his lawyer, like, yeah, you know, I, I went driving, I went this direction, and then they find out that there's something that puts him somewhere else. It could be. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, that one's 100% beyond me. If BK is used to driving at night all the time, why did he, why did his dad have to fly out and drive home with him? That's a good question. I wouldn't drive around back, dark back roads, ju just though, just to loop around my hood. Let's see, exhibit A, exhibit A, sus. Put some stars, guys. I can't. I'm not seeing anything. Huh? That's not cool. Somebody threatened Melissa J and said they would come to her house. That's not cool. Do we ever find out anything about Koberger's parents going before a grand jury in Penn? Was nothing or something? I've asked. I've asked a few people, and the only thing that I've found out is that uh, they were asked to go in. <laughs> Outside of that, I have no idea about anything. I don't think he was involved. I don't think anything came out of it, but it is kind of odd that they did ask him to come in. I've always wondered why Brian just kicked heroin as a teen. No talk, treatment received. What changed in his life to prompt it? I have no idea. Oh, wrong one. Talk about the Strava app mentioned in the warrant, what the app can show. Never heard of it until this case. So Strava is a running app uh, that you have to get permission to show where you're at. And on that app, he had a six-mile uh, run that he had documented while he was in Pullman, uh, Washington. So that means that he was active on it while he was in the area. So that app is probably going to be crucial to his locations and his GPS locations during you know, the weeks leading up to the murders and, you know, maybe even the night of the murder. So, yeah, go check it out. Um, he had a profile. He had one run logged in six miles to do or six minutes to do a mile, which isn't isn't is no slouch. That's for sure. Dan, do you know what the drive Roar is. I heard it mentioned in the last hearing, and I'm not sure what that is. I do not know. Do 
<laughs> been guilty, not guilty of two murders, pled out manslaughter and great bodily injury, self-defense, gang related, uh, drug trafficking. Uh, I also know a little bit about the uh, about the court process as well. I'm not saying that you don't. Let's see. Do you think that BK was waiting at night that Kaylee was back there? Or do I think that he was? She was waiting. He was waiting for a night that he. I don't know. You know. Here's the thing about that. I, me personally, just me. I think that there was a, a um, a scanner involved, a police scanner. I think that he may have had one on his phone. You know, if um, you know, he turns his phone off at two forty-seven. And I think that that's around the around the time that the Banfield kids are getting stopped. Now he drives straight, you know. Well, according to the PCA, he's seen leaving, going straight towards a road that would go directly towards Moscow. Now, had he gone straight there and gone straight to the victim's house, he would have gotten there at around three o'clock, three o five, which is still when the undercover guys were still there. Now, we know that his phone was off. So, you know, if he had some sort of scanner or something like that, I think he would like a radio, so to speak. I think that he would have just had that on and been able to tell when those officers left. But the probable cause affidavit starts off with him being at the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive, which is right behind the police department. And my thoughts were, you know, he turned off his phone in Pullman. He's driving straight to the house. He sees the undercover. He can't turn on his phone, right? Because that's where this app is at. So he drives around. He drives behind the police department and waits until he sees that undercover vehicle back at the police department. At 326, he sees it. Th he sees the vehicle there and makes a beeline towards the, vi the victim's home. Now, the next morning, the... Um, he goes back. Now I question why would he go back? Right. I mean, if he doesn't want to get caught, he goes back with his phone on too. Why would he go back with his phone on? Well, here, here's why. If he had this dispatch app and well, well, here's why I think why he can't search up Idaho murders on his phone, right? Cause if nobody's found it uh, and he searches it up before the bodies are found, then that's going to be a bit of a problem, ain't it? And he probably has, um, well, so he can't, he can't look it up. He wants to go back right now. Just because it's not in the news doesn't mean it hasn't been reported. Doesn't mean that at any point from the time that he leaves his house to go back to the victim's house, that somebody could have reported those bodies and that police could have shown up and there could have been a perimeter set up taking down license plates. So for him to go back with his phone on, there had to be a purpose. And I think that purpose is that he hadn't heard anything on the radio. He hadn't seen anything in the news. So he felt it was safe to go back. So he went back just to see what happened. Why, you know, what's going on? And then he leaves. So I think that because of those two reasons, there, there was a, a scanner. Now, the reason why I think it was at night is, is it perhaps while he was listening to that scanner uh, that he figured out there was a, you know, those undercover cops that were in the area uh, stopping underage drinking, the ones that were out with the Banfield kids? You know, what do you think is a product of cops being in a neighborhood? Well, parties are going to be dispersed. And it doesn't matter if they're the cops are there specifically for the parties, but if they're in the neighborhood, the illegal activity such as drinking and, and underage drinking would be minimalized. Is it possible? He also knew it was very quiet because of the radio calls and things like that. So I think that had more to do with why it was that night than it was because Kaylee wasn't there. I think it had to do more with the opportunity yeah, yeah, the opportunity in that moment because it was quiet. There wasn't a party going on. You know, the night before they had 150 people out there, which also would help him out because with 150 people going in and out, that's a lot of footsteps. That's a lot of DNA 
you know, transfer DNA going back and forth, things like that, that could have masked anything that he may have left behind. But he left his DNA on something that was brought into the house, which was the sheath. So that's the worst thing he could have done. Worst thing he could have done. <laughs> Did the DoorDash driver drive a white sedan? What color was his car? Psh, I have no idea. But the the I, I find it funny that people really think that the cops here are so stupid that they would see the door dasher and think that the person that committed this crime, you know, wouldn't have thought that, oh, it could have been the, uh, that's, the, that's the door dasher. And that's not, you know, and that's why they're driving around back and forth. You know, this person went in and identified who they were. We know that there's a picture of the intersection or there's a camera facing the intersection of King and Queen Road. So I'm pretty positive when that person self-identified and came in, they were able to identify which vehicle was theirs. Right. And there's some unique identifiers about Brian Koberger's car, such as a missing front license plate that if the door dasher had been from the area, wouldn't have just food for thought. Is Dinky over? Caught me moonlight. Oh, I don't know. Oh, sorry, that wasn't for me. Let's see. <laughs> appreciate the community. Oh, we appreciate you too. We appreciate everybody that comes in, regardless of anything. BK knew law enforcement were looking at Elantras. That's why he didn't change cars. Yeah, I think that would have been suspicious. You know, had he changed cars after, you know, they were looking for an Elantra. Yeah, that would have been suspicious. It wasn't there an interview with people in the apartment below him that said that he was always vacuuming in the middle of the night. Yeah, there was. It was uh, that he was always cleaning. He was being kind of loud. I ran out of questions. <laughs> Who is the person witness being protected? I heard an opinion post on the subject. Thought. See, I don't think it's actually a person. I think that the um, family members found in the IgG were are those that are being considered protected witnesses or or co defendants or whatever you want to call them. I think that those are the people that they don't want to disclose because those are people that have nothing to do with the crime outside of um, a distant relationship to Brian Koberger. So I think that's what it is. I don't think it has anything to do with, you know, somebody that actually witnessed the crime or anything like that for or against Brian Koberger. Oh man, I'm almost to the end. Let's see. Danger, danger, danger. <laughs> Drive report. Okay. Do you think the perp had previously done the exact route as a dry run many times, just went it on the 13th, just went for it on the 13th speculation? I, I do. I do think that he drove through there a few times. I mean, he drove around for a little bit there in the back area of, of um, Idaho without his phone on or GPS on, we can assume. Uh, I would assume that, well, let's just, well, let's reframe this. It, according to him, he was out driving around doing these long drives through Idaho with his phone off for the, you know two hours. You would assume that that person had driven around a lot through that area uh, to be familiar with that area to drive without GPS. But had he not, had he not done that, you know, it's just kind of weird that he, he knew where to go and only living there for you a few weeks maybe a couple months right uh like seven eight weeks somewhere around there so you know for him to be very familiar with the area especially at night with low light pollution yeah i don't know 
I hadn't seen him on here on the channel since. Okay, I got you. <laughs> Is it true BK and B Kopaka used to jog together? No, I don't think so. <laughs> there was another person that came forward that said that they used to jog, uh, that they would run miles. It wasn't Kopaka, it was some other guy. Can't remember his name, but it was a friend of his from where he lived. <laughs> but the cops are on it, Daniel. Of course, they didn't investigate the DoorDash driver. Sarcasm. <laughs> Let's see. Um, why would <clears throat> why would he get the driving log reset when he allegedly had the car service on the way back to PA? I don't know. I don't know if he did that or not. Do I think that Bethany really has exculpatory evidence? No. You know, I think that um, they're saying that it's possible, maybe, perhaps, could have. You know, they're not saying she does. She she did. She there. It's there. It's the possibility. Just kind of like his alibi. You know, he said that his alibi could come out in cross examination of uh, the other um, state's witnesses. Who do I think that the 400 witnesses are that Ann Taylor's trying to summon? I think fraternity guys are quite a few. Probably the guys at the grub truck. You're probably looking at the or guys and gals at the grub truck, guys and gals at the corner club. Uh, there may have been um, people they wanted to speak with the night before. You know, if anybody was acting odd, there was 150 people at that party at their house. I think that a lot of those people would want to be spoken to. So I think there's quite a few people that they can talk to. It might be an exaggerated number as far as how many they intend to actually bring to court. But yeah, you know, a lot of what Ann Taylor has put out there is put in a, in a way to, and eh, it's good luring to side with her narrative. Still find it unclear what the motive is. Um, well, let's put it this way. So you have audio 50 feet away. And it picks up a thud, some whimpers, some voices, dog barking. But what it doesn't pick up is, you know, the act of emotion, yelling, rage. You know, somebody was drunk and on steroids, roid raging. If it was multiple people running up and down the stairs or, or things like that, you know, there's no sound of that. There's no sound of a love struck person, you know, screaming, cussing. If they're going to go through three people to get to one in an act of you know, passion or rage, there's sounds that are associated with that. And we don't hear that, you know, so the question then becomes, is it a professional hit or is this a uh, crime of a, the thrill now for it to be a professional hit? And there's gotta be a reason why. And they have a download of these people's phones, you know, the victim's phones. So if there was something there that would alleviate or elude that, uh, there was drugs involved uh, then or a reason for somebody to go in there and, and take their lives. I'm pretty sure they would have found that. It would have been easy to find. Those type of cases are easier to solve than you think. And then, um, so I, I doubt it's that. So it leaves you with a thrill kill. You know, it kind of fits all those boxes, the stealth, the lack of evidence, the preparation that was put into it, um, the preparation that was put to get away with it after the fact. You know, for him not to leave his DNA, you know, let's just take Brian Coburg out of it because some people get blinded by his name. Somebody went in there and took the lives of four people. And if we took the knife sheath out of it, they, they, they stabbed these four people. So that means they were fairly close to these four individuals. And they didn't leave any DNA of their own behind. Somebody had to have gone through a lot of planning to do that. And 
how unlikely one person can do it and makes it multiple times unlikely that multiple people could do that. So I do think it's just one person. And I do think it was a thrill. I'm going to answer maybe one or two more. Let me see. Getting towards the end. Ah, I am at the end. Nice, nice, nice. All right. Nobody else wanted to jump on. Um, I'll give you Twiz. You want to jump on? Uh, the link is in the comment section. Uh, well, evidence was in plain sight. It was a box that we were able to debunk that had nothing to do with the case. So uh, we found it on here. It was some booties. Uh, we went through some other pictures and we were able to debunk that it was not um, Brian Koberger's booties. They were brought by police. So we will debunk even the things that may perhaps go against or for any narrative that people may think we have. Jump on, jump on. Angel, you can jump on as well. Uh, you guys, your faces will not be shown uh, like nobody else has, <laughs> has been. But if nobody's going to get on, I appreciate it. Um, you know, everybody coming out, clickbaiting as Daniel, eh, it could be. Sometimes that's what it takes to get the attention, to get the information out. But no, I didn't clickbait. I legitimately I went through the pictures. I saw that and I was like, hey, that looks interesting. You know, somebody was in my live chat saying that there was booties that were collected at his apartment complex. Could these have been it? And then going through the uh, other pictures alongside with you guys, we end up finding the same box outside of the victim's house. And so putting two and two together, it's probably not affiliated with Brian Coburger and more than likely brought by the Idaho State forensic team. I'll uh, make sure nobody did any more supers. Nope. All righty, guys. With that being said, I'm going to jump on out of here. I'll be back on Sunday when uh, we do our members only live. So if you want to be a part of that, make sure you hit that join button. With that being said, we're out of here. Peace.